Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and our goal is to help the military community succeed in their civilian career. Today's episode number 325, Clark Kenning, your resume with Shannon Gregory. And it's not, it's not fibbing or it's not um, equivocating or lying. It's just allowing for, if I'm applying for a um, operations manager role, I have to really tailor my resume to talk about operations management throughout my career from the beginning and take out the things that have no reason or don't align with that particular thing. So it's tough to do that. It's tough to take out things that, you know, that, you know, some swords that you had to fall on, things you were some real things you had you worked through, some things you really work hard on. Um, I have several resumes that don't have my Marine Corps service on because I don't have room in 25 years of service to put everything in. So I talk about specific roles that align with each particular role. That I'm in. Shannon's military career includes time in both the Marine Corps and the National Guard, so he has faced multiple transitions. Shannon has been a mentor at the University of Minnesota, and it comes through because he has so much great advice on topics including resumes, how he has nearly a dozen versions of his resume based on to what job he is applying, being Clark Kent, not always revealing your superpowers. Yes, you may have dozens and dozens of crazy stories from the military, but based on the position to which you're applying, you may just pick one choice gem out and leave the rest in the bag, unused in both your resume and your interview preparation. Networking. Shannon has received several jobs and, more importantly, very helpful intel about the jobs to which he's applying due to his approach to networking. We also talk about dealing with depression. We talk about how most of what you need in your civilian career you learned in the military, but it is all about lifelong learning. We talk about building skills and adding to them every step of the way. And Shannon is a great example of this. He's held three different jobs and also earned his MBA leading up to his role at Excel Energy. While he may have gone directly into the energy industry, his circuitous route was exactly what Shannon needed. And we talk about the energy industry in particular, why you don't have to be a Navy nuke just like me to go into the energy industry. We talk about all the disruption and changes going on and how the energy industry needs fresh perspectives like Shannon's or maybe even yours. This is a sponsored interview, which means that Excel Energy supports Beyond the Uniform financially so that we can continue to do this work for free for veterans. I'm very grateful for their support. Although this is a sponsored interview, Shannon and I only talk about Excel Energy for about four to five minutes in this hour-long conversation. The rest is packed with tactics and tidbits to help you in your career path, whatever that may be. As always, at beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find show notes with links to everything we discuss. You'll find 300 other episodes just like this, as well as other free resources. So with that, let's dive in to my conversation with Shannon Gregory. Joining me today in Minneapolis, Minnesota, my guest is Shannon Gregory. Shannon, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Uh, Justin, it's a pleasure. Thanks so much. I appreciate uh, being here and your audience. Thank you. Mm -hmm. For listeners, I want to share a brief background on Shannon. He is currently a program manager of enterprise resiliency for Excel Energy. He started out in the Marine Corps where he served in the infantry for over six years. He has also served in the Army National Guard for nearly eight years And his post-military career has included working as a rotary wing pilot at Air Method, a senior corporate security manager at Target, and a safety business consultant at Predictive Safety SRP. He holds an MBA from the University of Minnesota and a Bachelor of Science from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Um, So Shannon, maybe just to start things off, anything to add or amend that bio that you'd like listeners to know? Well, great. Um, you know, it's it's always fun to, to hear your bio and you're kind of humbled by it. So thanks uh, so much to pay it homage. Um, I was pretty lucky to, to, to spend uh, quite a few years local here in, in, in the National Guard. And um, really my last, my first six years was as a Marine. And then my last, I'll say, um, 19 years was actually as a, as a National Guard member and as a full-time member of the force. 
um, for about uh, 15 more of that. So I was pretty excited to, to be able to get that opportunity and pretty fortunate and blessed. So thanks for mentioning that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What, what was your transition like? It's interesting because it's, it's almost seems like you had more than one transition. You had the transition out of the Marine Corps, you had the transition from the national guards. And so what would you want, uh, what would you want listeners to know about what that transition was like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, both transitions, uh, were pretty, were pretty tough at first. Uh, my initial transition out of the Marine Corps really, um, I, I came out um, as, a, as, a, as a combat veteran in the 90s, late 90s, when really not a lot of folks were, and I was really trying to figure out where um, my footing was and where I could uh, start going to college and get prepared for that. Mm. So it was one of the things that was very difficult at first. I had a family, um, mm. you know, two kids, or excuse me, one kid at the time and, and married. So it was, it was interesting to, to, to really okay, what job am I going to take? You know, Mm. is my five-year plan going to be? And I was lucky that in my military career, as I left the Marine Corps, I had a couple of people looking out for me and gave me some direction. So it definitely helped. Um, The transition program back then was very basic. Mm. And now it's much more uh, comprehensive and really talks about the whole soldier, uh, sailor, airman, or Marine that's going to be transitioning off of active duty. Hmm. And we'll, we'll talk about Excel in just a little bit, but I'm curious, you, you kind of took multiple positions up until your current one and they, they switched industry. They switched kind of the, the, the functional role. You're definitely not unique in that. I feel like most of my guests do a fair bit of exploration of dabbling before they start to get more insight on what they want to do but could you walk us through your road to Excel and some of the work that you did, what you liked or disliked about that and ultimately how you ended up at Excel? Oh, great. Thank you. Um, You know, one of the ways I ended up here at Excel was a a good friend that I had when um, I transitioned into the national guard. He was actually my first company commander when I joined the National guard and I reached out to him and really noticed that with, um, one of the places I was working just wasn't a good fit. So I was looking for something that had a value added, um, an extreme value added organization that um, every day you walk in the door, you know, you're here for a reason. Hmm. We're a public utility. So with that, um, you know, you're here to try to harden um, the organization, especially when it comes to responding to um, crisis. So I wanted to be a part of an organization where okay, if something is awry here, it's going to be on the news. It's important for those wake up at three o'clock in the morning. Hey, if I got to come in, um, I'm excited about it because it's, it's a big deal. Um, as, as a lot of you know, here in the uh, Midwest, the, the winters are, are tough. In Minnesota, I mean, last year we were minus 25 and, and below. So at that point, it became very apparent that the job here, especially when it came to natural gas and our response to that was pretty important. Also in our electric side, it was also very important. So um, I talked to an individual that was here. I wanted to know what he was doing here and really want to benchmark his walk to get here through my walk. And that's how I was able to, to, mm. that to get here. So it definitely helped out having someone on the inside. Mm. That's, that's great. I mean, a couple of things I just want to earmark for listeners is first of all, it sounds like this came about through a friend, someone you, you served with in the military. Yeah. I would say that anecdotally, that seems to be the vast majority of guests on the show find at least one career opportunity through their quote unquote network. I know a lot of listeners don't like Absolutely. that word, but it's, it's very true. And then I also love that, um, you know, I, I'm guessing that you, like most of us, felt a very strong purpose in the military, in uniform. And I know that so many guests on the show have talked about how that is something they miss when they leave the military. And so it sounds like one of the things that you're scratching the itch for now is having a purpose, being part of something bigger than yourself, giving back and feeling part of a big community and Absolutely. being part of meaningful work. And I think that that's great for listeners to know that, um, it's very likely if you're under active duty, 
you will miss that component. And Shannon has found a way to, to, to meet that need. I think that's great. Yeah, I think um, like, like, like many of us, we're, we're always looking for our tribe. Um, so you leave your one tribe where you're in, ingrained with, live with. I mean, every day is an adventure um, to not having a tribe. Mm -hmm. like that. So one of the things I, I, I did is I looked for a tribe. And one of the things I loved doing was flying. So I started, um, I, I just called the guy that had a helicopter asked if he needed another helicopter pilot. Do you need a helicopter pilot? I have this feeling you need one. And he said to me, you know, funny enough, I do need a guy. Mm. And if you come out and fly our helicopter, that'd be great. So it was, a, it was a neat way to use the skill that I already had to find my tribe. Also, a church is a great place to do that. Um, I found a really good church um, that had a men's group that liked to go shoot. Which mm. is, so it's like a shooting group where we go out and, you know, basically have a good time. And it's just another way that I was able to find my tribe um, outside of the military. And then there's other, um, other cold heart groups, much like um, the Carlson School it was a very cold heart heavy type um, executive MBA program. And that generated one, a tribe and two, a bigger network that I could go to and folks I could have coffee with and really talk about um, not only what's going on in their lives, but some of the opportunity that, that may exist in their, uh, in their organizations, which is still a neat thing to be able to do. The, the, uh, the opportunity I had at Target was through Carlson. I had an individual that worked there and it was need to talk to a buddy that was in my tribe that was actually in the MBA program that led me to that um, opportunity. So yeah, there's, there's never too, um, too much time to find a tribe and find a, a group of people that you relate with. And in that group, I can guarantee your listeners that there's opportunity there. I, I love the way you position this around tribe. That really resonates with me. And I think that you're giving a lot of great examples, like the military is one tribe, church, or any sort of religious organization could be another tribe sure. to deepen those connections. And I love that um, you're pointing out that that undergrad or grad school can be a way to just, just add water and instantly increase your tribe. And what I love about that is not only does that give you a connection with others, I think that most people I interview talk about loneliness or feeling disconnected after having such a tight unit, such tight yeah. connection to the military. And then you're very often geographically separated in a new environment. You don't have that mm -hmm. support structure. So I love the support and self care that you're getting there. But then I also love how, um, I, I'm just a big believer that when you're hanging out with people that you connect with, we all want to help each other. It's not like your old company commander who eventually led to your job at Excel. It's not like there was something necessarily in it for him. It's not like he wanted something out of you. Like he right. genuinely liked you, I'm imagining, and wanted to help. And I think that most of us are like that. And my, my um, story that I make up here is that you were creating more opportunity for serendipity because you were putting yourself out there. And I yeah. particularly love the courage. I mean, it takes guts to call up someone you don't know and be like, Hey, do you need another pilot? And that paid <laughs> off. I mean, like, and, and right. that could have been a hundred of those calls with them saying no, but eventually someone's going to say yes or know someone. And I just yeah. love that, that story of courage. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you know, it did, it was just one of those things that came to me like, you know what? I bet they could use another guy. So mm -hmm. yeah, enough to put yourself out there and reach out and talk to people. It's a great thing. So what I'm doing now is doing a little bit more of that tribe find, finding as well. Um, I'm also a policy fellow at the Humphrey school of public affairs here at the university of Minnesota. So I'm a policy fellow here. And that again is just another tribe of individuals that, um, that have a passion for public policy. And, um, that also is another group to reach out to as well. So finding your tribe, finding your group, um, and using the, you know, the networking word. Yes, that is something that definitely that folks 
we'll need to start. We have a, a local group as well called the Eagle Group here in Minnesota, in St. Paul, Minnesota, and the cities here. It's also another veterans group that helps folks um, align and also find really opportunities throughout the, uh, the metro area. And then lastly, I try to give back as much as I can, especially to um, the University of Minnesota, where I've been called in as an adjunct um, career counselor for military transition, which is kind of a neat thing. I was not expecting it, but um, many times they call me in to talk to individuals who want to get into um, an advanced degree program, like a, an MBA program, and and how those folks, once they have the degree, once they're getting to it close, how do they align themselves on the outside to put their resume out there or put word out that they're actually looking for um, a new role at a level that is commensurate with uh, an MBA? Is there, given the, I'm, I'm imagining you've worked with a lot of different veterans in that capacity, and I think it's great that you're giving back in that way. Is there any common trends that you've seen if you had a generic veteran in front of you who's graduating a program about to go find a job is there any um advice you'd like to give to our listeners based on the people you've worked with and things that they might likely face themselves absolutely one of them is resume writing um, it is tough for us to dial down the neat things the courageous things that we've done um, I cannot write on my resume that um, I flew tier one individuals in the area of operations and qualified in night vision, goggle flying, and low loon sort of all weather type situations um, under enemy fire at times. I, I can't put that into I can't put that into a resume. So what you have to do is dial it back a bit, and I have. I have a library of resumes. Why? Because every single job application requires a different type of resume to basically fit that particular role. And that's something that I didn't want to do um, when I started at Carlson. I just didn't want to do it. I didn't think I needed to. I felt like, hey, this is who I am. If you don't like it, take it or leave it. And through a little bit of a career counseling at the U of M, and a lot of talk with friends, I realized that I had to really start tailor making some of this. And it's not, it's not fibbing or it's not um, equivocating or lying. It's just allowing for, if I'm applying for a um, an operations manager role, I have to really tailor my resume to talk about operations management throughout my career from the beginning and take out the things that have no reason or don't align with that particular role. So it's tough to do that. It's tough to take out things that, you know, that, you know, some swords that you had to fall on, things you were, some real things you had, you worked through, some things you really worked hard on. Um, I have several resumes that don't have my Marine Corps service on because I don't have enough room in 25 years of service to put everything in. So I talk about specific roles that, align with each particular role that I'm applying for. And I call it also uh, Clark Kenning. There are times when you have to go to work, once you get the role, you have to Clark Kenning down a bit because a lot of us are super men and super women and we wanna come out with all of it, you know? And there are times where, and I even have a pair of glasses for that actually. Um, but I call it Clark Kenning. You have to dial it back a bit and be Clark Kent sometimes because we can't always be Superman or Superwoman when we're at the job because we want to solve every problem. We want to be, we want to manage everything. We want to be um, at the helm of all things that are happening in our new role. And we have to Clark Kent it back a little bit. And I would also, um, I get very uh, cautious about telling my stories, about telling military stories to civilians. And I don't always do it unless um, I'm, I'm in a situation where um, the opportunity presents itself and it's appropriate. Hmm. So much yeah, I love about that. Yeah. <laughs> right. There's some <laughs> stories ahead. that everybody would need to hear. So yeah. you want to do your best to, um, you know, still be approachable and not seem as frightening because some of you, some of you gals and some of you guys listening are frightening folks and done some amazing things. <laughs> 
And it's, it's not always, and no offense to anyone, it's not always appropriate in the, in the work. You want to dial it back a bit, bring it down about, I'd say five notches and, and Clark Kennedy as you're in the workplace. I think that's wonderful. I love on the resume front, I love, um, I don't think we've had anyone on the show actually talk about that before, that you have many, many different resumes. And I can imagine how many listeners might have some pushback. Like you said, I, I um, honestly would have that approach of like, well, this is me, they accept me or not. And I'm also really aware that, um, you know, it doesn't happen often, but if, if my nieces, my five-year-old niece asked me about life on a submarine, I'm going to explain it very differently than I would right. to, you know, uh, my brother-in-law. And I would explain it differently to someone who's maybe worked in solar energy. Like it's, there's different ways to tell the same story. And it's just, right. I view it almost as a kindness to the person I'm talking to is how do I tra translate what I'm talking to in a way that's going to be accessible for them. And what right. you're talking about is, you're doing the heavy lifting of understanding what the role requires and you can reach into your giant bag of tricks and present the objects that are most relevant to that job. And in doing so, you're demonstrating that you understand what the job takes. And, and it, is, it is difficult when you have so many great experiences to be like, man, I've got this freaking crazy story in here. I'd love to use it, but it just doesn't, it doesn't. I'd be telling that story for me, not for right. the hiring manager, not for the job I'm Absolutely. applying to. And that's great. And I, I love how that translates to to um, not maybe oversharing about our military experience with <laughs> right. people where they're like, you know, I, I was looking for a one sentence description of what you did in the military. You just gave me uh, platoon, uh, you know, <laughs> this rated right. R version of, of something might not be appropriate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, actually, let me make space. Anything else? Um, also on the other side, I know that you work with veterans who are, I, I'm guessing, thinking of applying to grad school or to an MBA. I'm sure you probably yeah. get some common questions there. What would you want listeners to know who are considering grad school or an MBA? I would let them know if they have any uh, post 9-11 GI Bill. In most cases, especially when it's a public school like the University of Minnesota is, it is 100% covered as long as you have the amount of time, the 24 months left of your coverage in your post 9-11 GI Bill. I was amazed coming back from a deployment and someone telling me this because I saw what the price tag was. It was a hefty, it was over $100,000 at the degree. So I thought no way that post 9-11 GI Bill is gonna cover it. However, being that it is at a pri or, or public school like the University of Minnesota, um, it was 100% covered. So go out there and use your, 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 your post 9-11 GI Bill, the, 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 the VA benefits that you have, because it's an exceptional opportunity for, to propel your career to the next level. And I waited and waited and waited. That's the terrible part about it. I waited for several years for the right time, and there's never really going to be a right time at all. So align it, go after it. Um, I had a really good uh, VA rep at the University of Minnesota that helped me. And actually, I went through it with a buddy. So a guy that I served with called me up and said, hey, let's do this program. And basically called me out, calling me a dork if I don't do the program. So I applied. I did an interview. I, I got in. And um, we sat next to each other for two years, funny enough, in this program. So. Long story short, use your benefits if you have them. Don't wait too long because, well, the ticker will keep ticking, and as you go forward, your life will get more um, complex, and uh, you'll have additional family demands. So I say do it as soon as you can. There's never a good time, and use your benefits. That's great. It's just also great to see how twice now in your story, I'm, I'm guessing even more, but you've been influenced by a friend from the military who is – pulled you somewhere that you might not want to initially have gone. And, and it's a, yeah. it's a good example of the, the 
positive peer pressure or the strength of connections who can get us out of our comfort zone, maybe Absolutely. see our blind spots, maybe introduce us to new opportunities. And it's, it's great to see that um, your, your network has done that for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was great to do that and great to have that uh, group of good friends that were able to push me. And I still look for those folks um, here at XL Energy, here at other places um, that I work with and not only push me on a personal level, but also a professional level as well. So yeah, I, I tend to look for those type of people in my own life. Hmm. Um, I read at the start of the program, I said that you are a program manager, enterprise resiliency. What is that? If you were to bump into someone on the streets who was on active duty, how would you explain what that title translates to in terms of like day-to-day -day life? Oh, great question. My job is to ensure that the enterprise here at XL Energy is ready for crisis. Mm -hmm. So primary role in each business area, so um, for instance, natural gas is a business area, operational business area, um, electric distribution and transmission are two different ones, to ensure that when a crisis happens, that we have the procedures and processes in place to respond instead of to react to them. So that's my role in a nutshell. Mm. Um, I'm surrounded by uh, emergency managers that are here at uh, XL Energy. I coordinate quite a bit with emergency managers that are out in city and uh, in uh, municipal sort of uh, areas out in our uh, out in our state and county. So that helps as well. And we're always engaged to ensure that we're on the right side of uh, our preparedness. And it's been a it's a, it's a new role. One, it's a new organization in Excel Energy, which is exciting. And three, we're always looking for individuals that have that skill set, that one, are detailed oriented, um, two, that have an eye for preparedness, and three, just have a tenacious state of mind that can, um, you know, help, uh, help when barriers are in front of them and, and, and be smart enough to, to ask for help when they need it. And that was one of the things I had a problem with when I first started to ask for help when I needed it. I would just keep nugging through and working hard and figured that um, if I work harder, this thing is going to get out of my way. And one of the things I was able to do, what I learned was uh, utilizing my boss and my boss's boss when I needed help. And um, that has helped greatly. Now we have, we're sought upon all throughout XL Energy to solve problems and to overcome challenges, which I'm excited about for 2020 as well. Hmm. I, I want to harp on two things here. I, first of all, I love that you're acknowledging the difficulty of asking for help. And that's certainly a trend that I've seen in my own life, as well as in most of the people I've had on the show. And I think it's good for listeners to know whether or not you realize it, it's more likely than not that you will have difficulty asking for help. And so to, to lean into that and to realize that it's actually an asset that the, in my view, the organization suffers when people are not asking for the help that they need and is readily available to them through right. mentorship and through other people in the organization. And then second, I love, uh, you know, at the start of the, the interview, you talked about, I think the way you had said it was, um, you know, this company commander told you about the opportunity and you started a conversation and you said something that struck me as like, you didn't want to pave your own way. You wanted to kind of follow the path of people who have gone before you or like learn how people had come to the organization. And so what I love, what you were just saying is you, you rattled off three different things that are important for this role. You talked about, uh, I remember you saying detail oriented and I, I interpret it as kind of calm under uh, stress, like level headedness. And in one other one, what I love is the sense of you networking, understanding what traits are important for that role. And then both with your resume, as well as preparing for the job interview, really, you know, again, reaching back into that bag of tricks and saying, there's thousands of things here. Let me, let me filter out and figure out which, which stories show I was detail oriented, which stories show that I was in a crazy situation and I remained sure. calm. And it's a, just a great way to think of um, approaching each job differently and presenting that version of yourself that's most aligned with that, the, the version of your history that's most suited to that. Absolutely. I, th I, I think it's, um, it all depends on your audience. But yeah, it, it was one, this is one of those roles that I was able to, 
able to share some of those situations a little bit more candidly than I would be as a manager, senior manager at Target. Mm -hmm. It was just a, 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 an, an easier transition for me than, than, than my previous role as a senior manager there. So retail to public uh, utility is definitely a, a, a different um, type of role, but it's more aligned with uh, what I'm used to. One, one just quick question on that is, I know there's no, there's no way to know this, but it's like you, you took us what I would call a circuitous path. You had retail, you had um, business school, and, and then you were Excel. Do you view like, was there a way in an alternate universe where you could have gone directly to Excel for you? Or what were those stepping stones important of like gaining some sort of skill and perspective to ultimately lead you there? Yeah, I think uh, that's a great question. I think I probably could have came straight here before my MBA was done. I, I probably could have did that and been in this role. However, though, it gave me an opportunity to have that, you know, an extra tool in my tool bag, really. The MBA helps. So um, I really wanted to wanted to get here, get to Excel Energy, and learn as much about the industry as I could, get smart in a couple of years, figure out really how this place works. And from talking to my director and other folks, really it, it, it takes about you know two to five years to figure out this, this industry and, and our organization. And then after that, start thinking about um, some leadership roles, some management roles at that point. And, and, and go further into being maybe a director or something of that nature where you have the opportunity not only to lead people, but to lead projects and, mm -hmm. and initiatives here in Excel. So I could have gone the route where I came here, but it helps just to have the degree done and in, your, in the bag and in your back mm -hmm. pocket and to, and to go forward. And, and all you really have to do at that point is just learn more about the organization because you already have the tools. Mm -hmm. Generally, most of us have the tools already. I think I had more leadership training when I was a company commander, and even before that, when I was a platoon sergeant, um, than I got from my MBA program. And that is a true statement. Um, the cool thing that all of us bring with us is a wealth of, of, of knowledge about how to manage people, initiatives, and very challenging things when it looks like um, we're not going to be able to accomplish a mission and having a great attitude about that. Um, and, and really, and really just being that person that is generally optimistic, detailed oriented and leading by example all the time. It helps when you already have that in your rucksack. That when you come to an organization, your boss doesn't have to worry about that part. Doesn't have to worry about returning an email or, or doesn't have to worry about, you know, doing your weekly report or it doesn't have to worry about um, um, if you're actually on your computer when you're supposed to be on your computer for working from home or something of that nature where the trust thing is so much easier because you already have that um, hardwired into your brain already. Mm, that's great. I love that. Um, another thing I wanted to ask about is, so my, my background is submarines, nuclear engineering. And so it was common for, for people I served with to immediately go into the energy field or the inner energy industry. And I'm curious about, um, for people like you who don't have a background as a Navy nuke or with energy or something that seems more directly relevant, um, why might this industry be a good fit for them? Well, because um, one of the big reasons is because um, industries like this are always changing and looking for new talent. We have an initiative, a 2050 initiative, that's basically wants, we're, we're looking to be carbon free by 2050. That's going to take a lot of different types of people from different parts of the organization to really uh, put their heads together and make that happen. So that's nuclear, that's wind, that's solar and a certain amount of natural gas at that point. I can imagine. So it's gonna take a different, a different amount of people to get there and different types and diverse backgrounds to get there as well. Um, one of the things that woke me up here that I thought was kind of neat is the use of drones here. Like, oh, that's neato. Um, how do I get into that program? But the average, um, the average individual coming from the outside can still be a part of that program that we have here. And it really, it has to do with 
the inspection of a lot of our either gas lines or transmission or distribution lines that we have. Uh, and those are in the mountains or um, in, in areas that are pretty, uh, pretty remote. We can use those in a cost savings way instead of using, you know, a guy like me, like a helicopter pilot. Mm -hmm. um, so there's various opportunities, very diverse opportunities for very diverse backgrounds, military backgrounds. That is. And they don't all have to be nukes going straight to nuclear. Um, they can be former pilots going to preparedness or former infantrymen going to uh, uh, business systems. Um, so yeah, there's, there's various opportunities there for growth and, and diverse opportunities. I think that's great. I, I, I think a pet peeve of mine is people in the military that think very literally and they think I did X in the military, therefore I will do X on the other side, especially right. when they didn't enjoy what they were doing, that specific functional role. Um, right. You know, a lot of the guys I served with, my, myself included, I, I didn't really actually enjoy the nuclear engineering side of things. I love the leadership component. So for me to have gone into a nuclear reactor wouldn't, I don't think, have been authentic for me. So yeah. I want to love, first of all, that you're a good example of that. And I, I would actually say probably most of the guests I've had on have gone on after the military to do something pretty different than what they did in the military. Sure. But what I really appreciate about what you just said is how Excel, how the energy industry in general, how they are benefiting from the diversity of backgrounds, the diversity of perspectives, how that's actually, it's not like it's a charity for them to bring you or someone else on. It's actually in their best interest to say, sure. look, we are going in a different direction and I think that that's from my limited understanding of the energy sector. It does seem like a, a sector that's got a lot of change going on in it. It's going to look very differently 30 years from now than it does now. And so how important it is for that sort of organization and that climate to bring on different skill sets to say we need, we need the collaboration of all these people to, to steer this ship in the, the right direction for where we're going. Absolutely. Um... Yeah, and, and I felt like I've been very, very uh, fortunate to have good leadership here that see that within me. And a good enough leader that says to me, hey, here's the deal. You're doing a great job here, but don't be surprised if people from other departments will want you here in the next couple of years. And my will not be broken, but it, it's just something that will happen because the pace and of, of business and, and how you interact with people inside and outside of our organization. So that part's pretty neat. I think I've been very, very uh, fortunate about that because, because folks know military folks know as soon as you get to the job and, and you hit the ground and you're there several weeks, you're there for a month and you know, when it's not right, you just know right away. And that, that happened to me, my first job that, um, when I got out right away, I knew my boss was, uh, was, was not the type of person I wanted to work for. So um, I decided, okay, I'm gonna have to go a different direction. So yeah, it's, it's not a mistake when that happens. It's just, just understand when it happens, it's a natural part of transition. It just, it just is. And it, it, the plenty of stories where guys and gals have gotten out and the first day they're, they're rushing to go to that first job and they get there and they're for a month like, no, I don't think this is it. Um, that is natural. Do you move? Is it always ready? Is it always time to move to the next job? Um, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. If there's an issue, some sort of integrity issue or something like that, um, I would recommend um, you look a little bit. However, if it's just something you don't want to do and something you don't like, think of all the times in the military where we, did, we don't like that didn't like to do. Um, there's, there's, well, I have a laundry list of them and I'm sure you do. So sometimes sticking it out also um, is helpful because it helps you see a little bit further. It, help and it helps basically widen your gaze a bit to see exactly what is uh, in your future. And as military folks, military leaders, there are times where when we come into a workplace, we might be kind of threatening also to people. So um, that's why I always say to kind of um, dial it back a bit, super, or not superman it up, Kind of Clark it down, dial it down a bit, and you'll start seeing some of those uh, opportunities come. I think it's great. There's uh, 
there's something that comes up when you were saying that around this thought of, of quitting. And um, one of my favorite professors at business school always hammered into us that old adage of hire slowly, fire quickly. Right. And um, when you were talking, it brought to me the inverse for the employee, which is, you know, it comes to me as like this sense of don't be married to a job that's not a good fit for you. And absolutely, I think we come from a culture and mindset that serves us in the military, in the defense of our country, which is I'm given a mission like and dislike doesn't have anything to do with it. I'm going to accomplish that mission. I, you know, very literally people will die in service of that mission. They right. have their team. They don't get a choice in that. They will die in service of that team. And that's great in the military. And on the flip side, it's not really a mindset I would argue serves us. And for you, when you're in that job and you realize like, this is, man, I, I made a huge mistake here. This is not a good fit for me. It is of interest to you and to the organization as quickly as possible to say, look, hey, this isn't a good fit. Best of luck. I'm going to go find something that's right for me. And you're going to find right. a candidate who's right for you. And I think that can be really difficult for anyone, but especially for military veterans where we've had beaten into us this thought of like quitting is, is, is failure. And mm -hmm. in this sense, it's almost like part of the process. And I love, I think it's great that you have, uh, it sounds like you're a manager is, is already setting the stage, which is like, man, we are a big organization and you are a talented individual. Sooner or later, someone's going to want to poach you to bring you into a different part of the organization. Yeah. And that's great. That's, that's how we work as a company is you find different challenges, you find different teams and that helps you grow. And I think that it's great that the, the contrast of those two and seeing now a positive example where you get to develop as the person you want to be, even if that means shifting within the organization. Absolutely, absolutely. And the cool thing about this place is there's more than two things that I like. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's great, you know, I love public policy. I think wind is really cool. I think um, energy efficiency is neat. I think um, um, the drone program is, is pretty awesome in figuring that out. Um, so yeah, I have a, a several of these little pockets of our organization that I want to learn more about and, and get more involved with. Um, and, and any organization you're part of, you should probably have a couple of those that you're really looking at. Oh, okay. I'm in this, I'm in this department. However, there's this other department I really want to learn about. And one thing I've been, been doing lately is, is doing some self, um, um, networking within the organization itself. There's a department that you like. Find someone that's at your level in this department or that, that department and reach out to them. Hey, let's, uh, you know, let's meet for a little bit or get a cup of coffee and talk about what you do. And that helps. I mean, it, it, it helps so much um, that um, it's, it's given me an opportunity to meet some new people. And funny enough, on projects, you might end up working with them, you know, six months down the road on a project. You had no idea, but meeting them already helps that you already have that rapport with. And, and I want to underscore for listeners, and I say this having spent the last 12 years in very tiny companies, one of the advantages of working at a larger company like Shannon with Excel is you have so many different swim lanes. You have so many different aspects to pursue. Yeah. Um, recently, I interviewed a corporate lawyer for Verizon and realizing like, wow, like, yeah, Verizon has a lot of stores and real estate and they need a team to actually assess that and purchase that that's a whole career field within one organization and you yeah. were just saying like you know drones piqued my curiosity I'm like oh wow like excel is a big company there's many many different areas there they're doing some st cool stuff apparently with drones and yeah. it's it's great for you to for many listeners to find an organization where you can evolve gain exposure to different functional areas, different industries, and, and start to, to have room to spread your, your wings versus, you know, for me with smaller companies, you know, you may have a desire to get into product management and that might not be a possibility, or you may want to get exposed to different technology that might not be possible at a smaller organization. So it's one of those trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely.
what is the, uh, just out of curiosity, what is it that you understand about the drones or what is that aspect of the business? Well, it's just um, something I'm, I'm looking into to start um, doing a little bit of exploration about and, and how to, one, get into the group, what do they do, um, who manages them, what's their work like, um, um, and, and that's really one of the things I want to learn a little bit more about. Um, why, are the, why do they decide to go to drones instead of helicopters? What is the mm -hmm. cost of things? What's the way forward? Um, are there some opportunities for growth there? So just, just basic questions that things I want to know about um, mm -hmm. that part of the organization. Same thing with public policy and legislative affairs. I mean, I'm excited about that. I want to learn more about it. Um, I did a kind of um, kind of a guided tour of our of our capital with our with uh, a couple of our lobbyists and hung out with them for a day. Shook some hands at the Capitol, met some people that had um, some influence with some of the legislation that's being um, projected um, that includes our organization. So that's exciting um, and, and just something new that I would have not been involved with if I would have just sat at my desk and gone home every day. So those are just opportunities that I'm looking for. And then one thing I do is set up for my team is to get them out as well. So um, I have an interest in wind. These wind turbines, are, they're amazing that we have in Excel. And some of our wind folks like, hey, how do we get a team tour to go out there so we can see it for ourselves to get people thinking about those things. Um, and it gives folks a, just, a, just a better viewpoint um, on, on what we do and, and gives us a little bit more exposure than they, than they currently have going and checking into their cube or sitting in their office. Mm. That's, that's incredible. I, what came, what struck me when you were talking about this is as let's say, as you described the, the, the drone part of the organization, you're modeling for listeners now within an organization, how you are researching a role, how you're understanding what the team is like, how you're understanding what skills are required. Sure. And I, I'm guessing that listeners can easily see how after you've done the coffee chats and gotten to, gotten the intel, how the part of Shannon that he will present to the drones team is different than the part of Shannon that he'll present to the public policy team or, or different, different organizations. One, Absolutely. I'm guessing you would pull out of the bag of tricks all of your aviation experience is directly relevant to drones versus sure. that not really probably being relevant at all for the public policy type of side of things. So I think it's just great to see that um, that skill that you were talking about with resumes and with interviewing it's not it's not wasted time for listeners to develop that skill because you're applying that throughout your career. You're you're doing that internally and externally with organizations. Yeah, yeah, and you know it just it it helps to. I, I think I learned that from the organization I left, um, the military organization of being Minnesota National Guard. As a, as a full time officer, you had to do that. As an information officer, I had to I had to reach out to a lot of people because. People wanted helicopters, and I had to learn more about my own organization and how to support them. Um, so I was lucky that I had very good leaders in that organization that encouraged me to get out and meet people and to really know a little bit more about um, how we can help and support um, our own organization. So now that I'm here, that same thing kind of holds true that if I get out a little bit more and I learn more about the organization and how I can support them in my current role, um, it helps me learn more and actually be more effective as well. That's wonderful. Um, are there any resources that you would recommend to listeners that could be books, podcasts, blogs, just anything that's helped you since you left the military that might, uh, might help listeners as well? Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I love reading. Um, one of the books that I've read actually just lately was called Get Wise. It's actually just a, just a book about um, by a guy named Bob Merritt and basically a book about living your life and how to be a good steward in your life. That's one. Um, two, I love adventure books as well. Um, so I've read uh, a book called uh, No Easy Day, which I mean, I could barely put this book down. Um, just a neat book about um, Navy SEALs and kind of how, um, how this particular individual found himself in probably one of the most high stakes SEAL uh, missions that were ever devised. And lastly, one that I want to pick up um, here in the next coming weeks is by uh, David Gogan's basically called You Can't Hurt Me. 
Um, he's, he's a an avid um, motivational speaker, Navy SEAL type, an extreme runner. Um, some some things that I always aspire to um, being in the military. I just love running and and I don't even have the body for it, but I, I do it anyway just out of spite. And um, so there's a couple of those. Also, I would um, on the transition side, um, I would look for local groups that are military transition type. Like here in Minnesota, we have the Eagle Group. Also, um, I would look for any institution you want to go to, look for any veterans groups within an institution, much like the University of Minnesota has. And then I would uh, also align with um, your VA representative at an institution that you want to um, attend. And I was so lucky to that the, uh, the individual at the University of Minnesota was so exceptional to us respond back within 24 hours all the time. You email her on a Saturday, she's going to hit you up on a Sunday, which I was very surprised by. I figured that since I'm going to email on Saturday, maybe they'll get back to you on Monday or Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Not so with the University of Minnesota. I mean, she was very good and very helpful and really provide us real-time information as we needed. Um, so that's a couple, a couple of things. Um, and then lastly, finding your tribe was the thing that was, is, is still helpful for me. Finding these individuals that you can talk to um, and then find a way you can give back. Find ways that you can help other veterans transition as well and not get hooked in the pitfalls that, that you were hooked into. And I've had a couple of them. So, yeah, yeah, those are a couple of the, the things that have helped me so far. That's great. And um when I, when, when you, when you said that you're, that you read a lot, I, I knew before you said that I'm like, Shannon's a guy that's like very passionate and like always growing and learning. So I knew I, you exude that as someone who's constantly learning. I want a second can't hurt me by David Goggins. I highly, highly, highly recommend that <laughs> listeners do the audiobook version on audible. It's the best audiobook I've done. I've done hundreds. Um, and a quick teaser that in the show notes, you get a free audio book if you're beyond the informed listener. So check that out. But what I love about it is um, he reads the, uh, the, 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 um, the guy that he wrote it with reads it, but he's in the studio with him and midway through the chapter. And at the end of each chapter, it transitions to pretty much like a podcast of them just riffing. So it's like the perfect blend between audiobook and podcast. And you end up getting my guess is that you get like 30 to 40% more content in the audiobook. And um, I know we've talked about David before on the show. I'm trying to get him on, but he check out Joe Rogan has interviewed him a couple times. I, I listened to the Joe Rogan podcast and I was just like, who is this dude? He is so motivational. He was the um, subject of a book called living with a seal uh, living with a Navy SEAL, which I also highly recommend. But um, And for listeners at beyondtheuniform.org, I'll put in the show notes links to Get Wise, No Easy Day, Can't Hurt Me, and the, and the other resources that Shannon ref, uh, referenced there. Um, Absolutely. I'm going to I'm gonna have to do that myself. It's great. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I, 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 it's one of those books too, that if you listen to while you're running, your pace will be like a little bit faster. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, well, I know we're at the end of our time. I always like to leave the last question open-ended and we've covered a tremendous amount of ground. I love your thoughts on resumes, on tribe. You've just given us so many gems here. Um, I'm sure there's things that we didn't get a chance to talk about. And so I'd love to leave the last two or three minutes here for either anything that we didn't cover you want listeners to know or just some final words of wisdom you'd like to leave them with before we wrap up. Um, yes. Thanks so much, Justin. And thanks so much for um, your, your audience today. I think one of the things I'd like to leave all of you guys with is when I was a Marine infantryman, um, we used to say, don't drop your pack or don't drop your ruck. Mm -hmm. um, there's no need to let everything go. Now that you're out, now that you're transitioning, some of the things that kept you um, aligned and kept you good at what you do are still going to be very, very important here as you transition. So extreme ownership, own up to things that you don't do right, that you want to do better. Be very passionate about your ownership in your own transition. Develop, look out for your own self-development as well. 
Make that a passion of yours and it'll always pay dividends. Um, the more good you put in, the more good can't help but get out. Um, deal with um, depression in healthy ways. And what do I mean? Seek out um, counseling. I see a counselor, I talk to a guy, I do. I do it once every couple of weeks if I need it or not. Why? Because it is an important part of my transition. Physical fitness as well. I have to stay mentally and physically fit. If I do not, um, I, will, I will move down in the seeds of depression and, and, and those things will start creeping into my own personal life. Um, I mentioned betterment and development. And lastly, one of the things that we don't pay attention to a lot, but I think everybody does, um, align your diet. Get smart about that. what makes people effective, um, either academically or physically, uh, in the workplace, what kind of diet are people? What are the things you're putting in? Do they need to be good things? Do they need to be bad things? I'm not saying don't eat a hamburger ever because I love hamburgers. I do. Um, I'm not saying don't get a beer every now and then. But um, the more you put in that's not going to help you will, will definitely hurt you in the end. And for the last thing, um, everybody needs it. I don't get enough of it, but uh, after doing some reading this week, make sure you get enough sleep. Mm. Um, spend time with the people that care about you. Um, be a good steward of good works. Um, have extreme ownership. Deal with your, 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 your bag of stuff with, in healthy ways. Um, make physical fitness a part of your life and also ensure that you um, go ahead and, and, and spend every day in some sort of betterment of yourself. And with that, sir, I'll give it back to you. Oh, I love it. I love it. And I just want to, you know, for listeners who listen to the Saturday informal behind the Beyond the Uniform episodes, we talk about um, therapy and mental health quite a bit. And I love everything you're naming, the um, therapy or executive coaching, physical fitness, diet, sleep. Um, my sense is that these things together make up over 60% of what makes us productive workers, members of society, family members, and they get 5% of the airtime. It's easier to talk about going to grad school. It's easier to talk about getting a certification. And yet, if you're able to be healthy physically, emotionally, spiritually, uh, uh, all of these things, they will make you a better version of yourself. And I appreciate your um, sharing that, especially around depression, which I think is much more common than people talk about. And I know I've struggled with that at times as well. And I also know that if I have these things dialed in, I'm much less likely to be comparative. I'm much less likely to feel lethargic and things like that. And so Shannon, it's been a, an honor to have you on. I appreciate um, your perspective. I appreciate the passion that you bring to our conversation and um, the meticulousness too. I just feel like you covered a lot of ground and I saw you, you know, taking notes and I just appreciate the energy you brought to our conversation because we crammed about two hours of information into this hour. And I, I think that's um, in big part to the, the energy you brought to our conversation. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And all of you um, keep serving, keep doing great things and uh, great things will happen. Service, service, service. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Quick couple admin points. Um, we release brand new episodes every single Monday and Thursday. Those are usually recorded uh, about a month or so before they go live. Um, and um, every Monday and Thursday, we have an interview, usually almost always with a military veteran about their civilian career. More and more, we're starting to add in experts who may not be met veterans, but may have some expertise that will help the military veteran community. Um, Saturdays, I typically post more of a behind the scenes episode, which is a free form format. I try to use what I'm calling a mullet format. And by that, I mean business up front, party in the back, uh, talking through admin points, uh, professional topics related 
to the podcast. It might be a conversation I had that week. It might have been an interview I had that week, but just trying to, to share things that are top of mind that may help you in more of a free form, straight from the heart format. And then the party in the back is the personal side of things, just kind of more free flowing uh, thoughts on life, on um, uh, improving oneself, just kind of whatever's going on in life and trying to be authentic and um, honest about um, those things as well. Special thanks. We have an all volunteer army of people behind Beyond the Uniform making this possible. Uh, we do this on our lunch breaks, on our evenings, on our weekends, because we love the military community. We want to give back. We want to make a difference. We want that as part of the purpose in our life that we we valued in the military. Um, so special thanks to Steve Bain. Steve does pretty much everything. He helps uh, secure guests. He does our newsletter. He keeps the reels rolling and keeps me sane. Kathleen Dillon, the first person to join our team. She writes text transcripts of every single episode. It's wild. She keeps up with two of these a week despite a demanding career and education right now. Uh, but those transcripts help us get more SEO value, helps her audience more. Um, Andrew Woolridge is our data guru. He helps us understand the numbers, which is the easiest way for us to figure out how we can better support you and um, adds kind of the, the data oversight for that. Rick Healy does all of our social media. He is gaining more and more of an audience for us by getting our videos, getting our podcasts out on social channels. Um, the best way to stay in contact with us is if you go to beyondtheuniform.org, there is a newsletter. You'll have a little pop-up that comes up. You can put your email in. We email twice per month. We try to be respectful, but it is a great way to get uh, appraised of upcoming events, upcoming interviews, promos where companies are giving discounts to Beyond the Uniform listeners, and more. Uh, this does cost money to put on. We are um, uh, committed to not charging veterans directly, um, and the way that we kind of offset costs is through corporate sponsors. So if you know of a company that would like to get in front of a military audience and their families, uh, that's one way that we can both add value to our members but also offset the costs of Beyond the Uniform and give us a little bit of budget to start expanding what we're doing. So that's the, the best way you can help us. If that's not something that you can do, a positive review on iTunes is greatly appreciated. Have a wonderful week. We will be back Monday, Thursday, and Saturday with more interviews. And uh, yeah, keep up the, the, the listening. Take care.